Hello everyone, this lecture is covering material from chapter 4 of your Marib text, which is talking about the tissues of our body. Okay, um, So in the last cha chapter, chapter 3, we talked about how we have a bunch of different types of cells in our body, over 250 different kinds that are specialized and each perform a specific function. Um, like muscle cells contract, are able to allow us to move our nervous system, Tissues allow our nervous system to send information, sensory information in, motor information out, right? So we have a bunch of different cells that do a bunch of different things depending on what types of, um, you know, organelles make them up. But cells have to work together to perform their specific functions, okay? So they do that by forming what we call tissues. Tissues are groups of cells that are similar in structure that perform common or related function, okay? So all of your cells of your heart, they're all cardiac muscle cells, right? Individual cells. Those cells can't perform the function of pumping blood through their body on your own, so they get together with the similar other cardiac muscle cells and make the tissues that form your heart, right? Without that connectivity between the other cells, they wouldn't be able to perform their function. Okay, so tissues are just groups of cells that perform a common function. Histology is the study of tissues. Okay, so in lab you will have an entire class dedicated to looking at histology. A lot of that information is going to kind of reiterate what we say in lecture, um, but this whole chapter is looking at histology and the, what the tissues look like, what they, um, what's their function, and so on and so forth. Okay, so in our body, we have only four basic tissue types. Okay, so four basic tissue types. So these, you need to know, are the basic tissue oops, <laughs> types. Okay, so we have nervous tissue, which general function is just internal communication. So your brain, spinal cord, and nerves are all made up of nervous tissue. Muscle tissue contracts to cause movement. So we have skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. Epithelial tissue, which forms boundaries between different environments. Okay, it's going to protect, secrete, absorb, and filter. So the lining of your digestive tract, all of your skin covering, um, the, the tissue that makes up the glands, that's all epithelial tissue. And then connective tissue um, is just there to support, protect, bind, and um, hold other tissues together. Okay, so connective tissue is kind of a broad category, um, but anything that's not one of the other three is going to fall into the connective tissue. So bones, tendons, fats, and other soft padding tissues. We're going to spend most of this um, lecture covering epithelial tissue first and then connective tissue. I'll probably break it into two parts. I'll quickly um, go over a little bit of some nervous tissue and muscle tissue. However, when we get to those chapters later on in the semester, um, we're going to spend a lot of time discussing the makeup of those tissues and how they function, their um, their jobs. So we're not going to worry too much about it today, just really basic stuff to get a kind of baseline of understanding. But epithelial tissue and connective tissue is what we're going to be focusing on. Okay. Um, when we're looking at tissue in histology, um, if you're in lab, typically you'd be looking at tissue under a microscope to identify the tissue. Um, and your book explains kind of how that works, but just if you're unfamiliar with um, histology and looking at slides under the microscope um, a lot of students say like well how can you see that you know so how it works very basically is the tissue is fixed meaning it's preserved with some sort of solvent okay so if you're looking at a slide you are looking at like a real section say you're looking at a, a, a skin section you're really looking at a slide of the human skin Okay, in order for that tissue to um, be on the slide and not, you know, fall apart, it needs to be fixed and preserved with solvent. The, slot, the 
skin slide in this example is sectioned, meaning it's cut into small slices that are thin enough to transmit light or electrons. Okay, so when you're looking at a slide of the skin, we'll see it a little bit later, you need to cut that skin thin enough that light can shine through and you can actually see the individual cells. Okay, and there's specialized ways that you section tissue. Um, and then finally, it has to be stained. Okay, so if you're just to look at a plain um, section of skin with no staining, you wouldn't be able to see anything. We stain it with some dyes, if you will, to enhance the contrast of the tissue. Okay. Um, artifacts are what distortions are. They are going to de detract... Um, what the sample would look like in living tissues, but that's not really important. I don't know why that's in there, but we stain the tissue so you can see the different features. So you can see the nucleus, you can see um, the cell membrane and all of the stuff that you need to look at. Okay, and there's a few different types of microscopy. Um, light microscopy uses colored dyes, and that's what we would typically do in our um, lab. Electron microscopy uses heavy metal coatings, um, which is not as important for you guys to know that, but... All right, so now let's get into actually what epithelial tissue is. Um, so epithelial tissue, like I briefly mentioned earlier, is a sheet of cells that covers a body surface or lines a body cavity. Okay. So it's always, always, always going to be next to some sort of open space, right? Because if you think about, if you look um, at a slide of tissue covering the surface of our body, it's going to be next to the air. If it's lining our digestive organ, right, there's going to be a space where food is traveling through that it's directly butted up against. So epithelial tissue is always going to be on the surface of something, okay? And it comes in two main forms. The main one that we're going to be talking about is the covering and lining epithelial. Um, again, that's just going to be on the surface, either external or internal. So on your skin, lining your digestive tract, lining your lungs, etc. Um, we also have glandular epithelia, which is just the secretory tissues that we can find in glands. So glands that produce saliva, mucus, um, all your glands, the tissue making them up and producing the gland itself is going to be epithelial tissue, okay? So in general, the main functions of epithelial are protection, absorption, filtration, excretion, secretion, and sensory reception. So there's a lot of different functions, and we'll talk about the individual types of epithelial tissue and their specific function, okay? And you're going to need to know the specific function of each different type. Okay. Epithelial tissue has five distinguishing characteristics. We'll talk about these each on, an, on a, a slide coming up, but epithelial tissue has polarity, so you should know what that means. It has specialized contacts supported by connective tissues. It's avascular but innervated and has a unique function of regeneration um, properties. Okay, so to start, polarity. Um, cells very basically just have a polarity, which means a top and a bottom, right? Just a, some sort of separation. Okay, so you're always going to see, again, because we have um, the cells lining the surface of the body or lining a body cavity, you're going to have a top surface of those cells. That's called the apical surface. It's going to border that open area that I talked about. And that open area is called a lumen. So anytime if you see an image of tissue and you see a big white space and then a layer of cells touching it, that tells you right there that that's your lumen. So if this is the digestive tract, this is where digestive fluids would be flowing through. If this would be your um, trachea, that's where air would be flowing through, right? The lumen is where the substances on the surface are going to be flowing. The apical surface is the layer of the epithelial tissue that is exposed to the surface or the cavity. 
Okay, a lot of them are smooth. I just draw, drew over this one, but this one was smooth. But some of them also have little projections on them called microvilli. Um, and those are to increase the surface area. Okay, so a lot of times in our digestive tract, you'll see little microvilli on the surface, kind of like this, little finger-like projections sticking up. Um, and in areas that we need to do a lot of absorption, like absorbing all the nutrients in our digestive tract, you'll see these finger-like projections of microvilli sticking up to increase the surface area so the cell can absorb more nutrients more quickly. Okay, so that's what microvilli are. So you have the apical surface on top, and the bottom you have the basal surface. Okay, so it's kind of harder to see because it's not next to this nice white, um, you know, lumen. But that's kind of a decent outline, I think, maybe. <laughs> maybe not the best. But the basal surface faces inwards towards the body. Okay, so what you're going to have is at the bottom of your epithelial tissue, you're going to have a layer of connective tissue. Okay, and again, connective tissue kind of just holds everything together. So on the bottom of all epithelial tissue, you're going to find a layer of connective tissue holding it up. So if you see the line between the nice arranged cells where you can see the nuclei and everything, and then kind of this just mass of just tissue that doesn't look like individual cells, that's connective tissue on the bottom there. Okay. And the basal surface of the epithelial tissue connects to the um, um, connective tissue. All right, so it attaches to basal lamina, which is an adhesive sheet that holds the basal surface of epithelial tissue to cells. So you can't really see it in this um, picture, but basically what you would have, so you have your individual epithelial cells, Right, so these are all individual epithelial cells. You would have, I'm gonna erase, oops, I'm gonna erase this. You would have underneath, so you have your apical surface up top and your basal surface down here. You would have a basal lamina, they call it, which is a sheet of a membrane that's going to connect your epithelial tissue to these connective tissue fibers down here. Okay, so it's kind of hard to see. Um, you can't see it very well unless you have a drawing. But the basal surface attaches to the basal lamina, and that basal lamina is actually what's going to connect the epithelial tissue to the connective tissue. Okay. Epithelial tissue also has specialized contacts, um, and we talked about different types of cell junctions previously, remember? Our cell junctions. Okay, and epithelial tissues have specialized types of these that you don't see in other cells all the time. Um, so they have to typically form continuous sheets because they're lining, you know, your skin or the whole lining of your digestive tract. That's going to be one sheet of epithelial tissue. Um, and we want good connections so that all those cells stay together. Okay, so you're going to see a lot of tight junctions and some desmosomes as well. And we talked about the tight junctions in the previous chapter, but when we have, whoops, when we have lining our digestive tract, say this is a row of cells lining our digestive tract, we have food flowing through here, right at the bottom of the cells we'd have our basal lamina, and then underneath the basal lamina we'd have some sort of Con connective tissue, right, holding everything down, <laughs> okay? Between these individual epithelial cells lining the digestive tract, we talked about this in the previous chapter, we have tight junctions holding them together to make sure that no pathogens or digestive enzymes or anything from the digestive tract can get through between those cells, okay? We want all that stuff to move continuously through the digestive system and not penetrate through the cells and get down into deeper tissues, potentially blood um, supply and stuff like that. So the tight junctions are going to be really important for um, these epithelial cells, okay? Okay.
We also have, um, I already mentioned this, but epithelial tissue is going to be always supported by connective tissue, right? Um, and it just kind of holds everything in place and keeps your body um, the shape and structure that it, that it has. Okay, so you have your reticular lamina, which is deep to the basal lamina. Okay, so we talked about we have our epithelial cells with your um, basal lamina. Okay, and then you so of your epithelial cells, you have your apical surface and your basal surface right on top of the basal lamina. You're going to have your um, another sheet. I'm sorry to use yellow. Another sheet called the reticular lamina. And it's going to be deep to the basal lamina, and it's going to be made up of more fibrous tissue. Um, it's a network of collagen fibers, which again is going to attach um, your epithelial tissue kind of just to the rest of your body. And that collectively makes up the basement membrane. Okay, so the basement membrane are these connective tissues underneath the epithelial tissues, that are just going to reinforce reinforce the tissues. They resist stretching and tearing, um, and they help to find epithelial boundaries. So knowing what's epithelial tissue and what's connective tissue down below. Okay, but you're always going to see that basement membrane when we're looking at um, epithelial tissue. You're always going to have the connective tissue reinforcing it. Okay, and tissues that are cancerous, they are not going to be bound to this basement membrane, right? Which is kind of interesting, but the cancer cells are gonna be dividing, right? Um, just willy-nilly, that's how you get tumors, right? Um, so instead of these epithelial cells being bound to this basement membrane and held in place by the connective tissue, you're gonna see in cancer cells, they don't have this boundary of the connective tissue. They're not bound to that. So they're just gonna be, um, connected to each other and just regenerating and regenerating and regenerating, um, which is what a tumor is made of, okay? Next, we have um, the epithelial tissue is avascular but innervated, and this is a really important point. So avascular, think vascular is blood vessels. So avascular means there's no blood vessels found in epithelial tissue, okay, which is a little interesting. The tissue gets its nourishment by diffusion from underlying connective tissues. So our connective tissues underneath have um, um, vascularization, right? So they have blood vessels running through them. So they can get nutrients directly from the blood, but the more superficial um Epithelial tissue doesn't have any blood vessels or any direct supply of nutrition, okay, which is um, not a bad thing, but it just means that it has to get its nourishment um, via diffusion from the connective tissues. Okay, so it's avascular but innervated. So the second part of this, innervated, means that it's supplied by nerve fibers, okay, which should make sense because if you get a little cut on your finger, you can feel it. The fact that you can feel that means there's some nerve innervation, okay? So our nerve fibers have sensory innervation, so we can feel a bunch of different um, types of sensation. We can feel heat, we can feel touch, we can feel vibrations. Um, all of those are specialized receptors innervated by nerves in our epithelial tissue of our skin, okay? And we'll talk about those more in detail when we get to the nervous system, okay? So avascular but innervated. And then the last um, one here is that epithelial tissue um, has really good regeneration properties, okay? Um, which is important because if it's covering the surface of our skin, it's going to be subject to a lot of abrasion or the tissues lining our esophagus are subject to a lot of abrasion as we're eating food, right? So it's really important that these cells can regenerate um, and replace the cells that ha get damaged um, or lost, okay? Um, stimulated by the loss of apical basal polarity, 
right? Which just means that it doesn't have the separation of the two surfaces. So as the cells on the apical surface die, the basal surface starts to produce more um, tissues, okay? Some, like I said, some cells are exposed to friction, um, some to hostile substances resulting in a lot of damage. Um, so again, those tissues have to be replaced. So on areas of high you know, traffic or friction, like our skin surface, our esophagus, um, places that there's friction, we're going to have to replace those cells. And then all through our digestive tract, those epithelial tissue lining the digestive tract is going to be exposed to all of the digestive substances. So all of the enzymes made to break down proteins, break down starches, are um, you know, exposed to that constantly in our digestive tract. Okay, so those cells don't have as much of a longevity as some other cells, so they need to be replaced more frequently. Okay. So that's the traits of epithelial tissue. Now getting into actually naming and looking at the epithelial tissue. Okay, so epithelial tissues have a two-part name. The first part of the name indicates the number of cell layers, okay? So a simple epithelial is just a single layer thick, whereas stratified epithelial is two or more layers thick, okay? And we talk about the function of these tissues. Anytime you see something stratified, you know the function of it is to protect, okay? So um, we have... Uh, I'll show you on the next slide, actually. Okay, and then the second part of the name indica indicates the shape of the cells. So squamous is flattened like a scale, so kind of like a pancake, I like to think of it. That's squamous. Cuboidal, the name tells you it's going to be a cube shape, so kind of a box shape, so what I was drawing earlier. And then columnar is going to be tall and column-like. Right, so more vertical than a square. Okay, so you can have simple squamous or you can have stratified squamous. You can have simple cuboidal, stratified cuboidal, and same for columnar. Okay, so again, here's just an image showing you this is what I was about to draw on the last slide. Simple, you have just again an individual layer of cells. If you have stratified, you're going to have a lot of cells stacked on top of each other, okay? Two or more layers of cells. And again, if you see a stratified tissue, you know the function is going to be protection, right? Because if we're on the skin surface, we don't want just one little layer of cells protecting the deeper tissues in our body from the cell, the, you know, our external environment. So our skin is going to be stratified so that if we get a cut or a burn or some sort of little abrasion, we have a lot of cells here to protect the deeper tissues, okay? These simple cells, you're going to see in places where we want um, materials to easily diffuse. So you're going to see simple um, in places of absorption, diffusion, filtration, Right? So lining our digestive tract, simple, one layer allows the nutrients to be absorbed and sent to the blood more quickly instead of having to go through like multiple layers of tissues, right? Um, in our respiratory system, we have a simple cell so that oxygen can be um, absorbed through your cells easily and sent again to the bloodstream to be sent around to the tissues, Okay. So the, again, we talked about this in all the chapters, but the structure of the tissues really tells you a lot about its function. And then here's a, just a better drawing of the different shapes of the cells. So squamous, again, flat like a pancake. Cuboidal, more square-shaped. And then columnar is rectangular, like a column. Okay, so let's start by talking about the different types of simple epithelial. Okay, again, simple because there's one layer, and like I mentioned previously, um, 
you're going to see that it's always going to be involved in absorption, secretion, filtration, diffusion. So moving substances around because it's easy for those substances to get through a singular layer. Okay. So I have all the different types of epithelial, um, their images here. You're going to talk about these as well in, in lab in great detail. So I'm not going to get um, spend too much time talking about them. I'm just going to point out some like main things. But for all of them, you're responsible to be able to identify them. Okay, so you have the image here. You need to know their function and their location as well. So what they do um, and then where you can find them in the body. Okay, so this first one here we have, again, these are all epithelial tissues. We're starting with the simple ones. So simple squamous epithelial. Um, and this one, the first few is kind of hard for people to see. But first of all, the first thing I want you to look at when you're looking at tissues is right here you see a lot of empty spaces. These would be individual lumens. Okay, so we have lumen, 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 lumen. Okay, so anytime you see a big empty space like that, you know you have to be um, epithelial tissue because you're lining some sort of cavity. Simple squamous tissue, um, this in specific one is in the alveoli or the air sac of your lungs. So it's kind of hard to decipher, but these individual pancake-shaped cells are the simple squamous cells um, surrounding the lumen of your air sac, right? So oxygen comes in, it has to diffuse into the um, epithelial tissue, and there's going to be some connective tissue and vascularization kind of deep that's hard to see in this image, okay? But simple squamous, again, allows materials to pass filtration and diffusion. It can also secrete some lubricating substances. So your serosa, your serous membranes, are made up of simple squamous epithelial as well. Okay, and then here's some lung locations. Again, I'm not going to go through every single thing here. But simple squamous. We have simple cuboidal epithelial, which again, which is going to be cube-shaped. Um, and remember, when we're looking at these epithelial tissues, you're going to look for first the lumen. So this is kind of harder to see, but this would be the apical surface, and in here would be the lumen. Lumen. And the round, you're going to have individual square-shaped cells, right? Cuboid-shaped cells. Okay, so this is simple cuboidal. And remember, with epithelial tissue, you have the apical surface, but you're also going to have the basal surface, which would be over here. And then all of this junk is connective tissue. Okay, so you're going to have basal surfaces of all of these different um, sets of epithelial tissue touching the connective tissue deep to it. Okay, but each of these is going to have an apical surface and a lumen on the inside. Okay, so some of them are a little bit harder to distinguish. Um, and again, remember, we literally had to cut tissue to get this image. So you're not going to get a cut that shows everything perfectly, but you're going to have some good examples of the tissue in that cut. So the function is secretion and absorption. Again, it's a simple tissue, so it's going to be able to move things in and out easily. You're going to find these in your kidneys, ducts, and glands. Other places too, but... Okay, and then we also have simple columnar. Again, so first look for the lumen, which this would be your lumen, right? And the apical surface would be this surface of your epithelial. If you look closely on this one, you can see the microvilli, right? So all these little um, finger-like projections are the microvilli on the surface, okay? And we have simple columnar, so we have these column-shaped, whoops, that, I messed up, these column-shaped cells, right, lining the surface, okay? Um, we're also going to see within simple columnar some goblet cells, 
and mucus, then those are going to be secreting mucus. Okay, so we'll talk about those cells a little bit more in a second. Um, this is lining the small intestine, this particular one. And again, remember, we have these microvilli to increase the surface area so that we can absorb um, more nutrients more easily. So a big function of simple columnar epithelial tissue is absorption. Um, and because we have these goblet cells in it, it secretes enzymes, mucus, and other substances. Um, and the location for this mostly lining the digestive tract. And also it's going to be in glands, bronchi, the uterine tubes, uterus. Okay. And it says here, I guess I'll talk about it, it has some types that are ciliated. So in addition to the microvilli, you're going to have cilia. And cilia are, are longer hair-like projections. And those, instead of just increasing the surface area, those actually move. So they're going to be responsible for kind of waving. Um, and if we're in an area, say we're in um, the uterine tubes here, say this is the uterine tube, we're going to have eggs being released from the ovary that have to move through the uterine tube. Those cilia are hair-like projections that can actually move the egg through. So they'll create this wave path, excuse me, a wave pattern and move the eggs through. Okay. Okay, the next type of tissue we're going to talk about is pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Okay, it's technically a single layer of cells, um, but they have different heights, so not all of them are going to touch the apical surface or basal surface. So it looks kind of like it's um, stratified, has multiple layers, but it actually um, doesn't, okay? But we call it pseudostratified, okay? And the surface of this, you can see the cilia that I was talking about on the previous slide, um, so those long hair-like projections. Pseudostratified columnar um, is going to be secreting substances, particularly mucus, and propulsion of mucus by that ciliary action. Okay, so I talked about that. Those cilia are able to move and propel mucus along. So it's going to be a lot in the upper respiratory tract and ducts, so sperm ducts and ducts of glands, propelling things through. Okay, and when you're looking at the tissue, again, I stopped explaining it, but remember we have a lumen on this side. This would be our basement membrane, the basal surface on the bottom. When you're looking at these tissues... All of these round things are the nucleus, right? So you have all these different nuclei of the individual cells. When we have the pseudostratified columnar, notice how the, the nuclei are all over the place, right? They're not ordered in any way, if you will. If you go back to our simple columnar, the nuclei are all in these nice straight lines, okay? So that's how you know if you're looking at a simple or pseudostratified layer, okay? If you have a nice line of single nuclei, it's going to be simple. If the nuclei are all over the place, it's going to be the pseudostratified, right? Okay, so now let's get into the actual stratified epithelial tissue. So with stratified epithelial, now we have two or more layers of cells, New cells are going to always regenerate from the bottom, so the basal cells closest to the basal membrane divide and eventually migrate towards the top. It's more durable than the simple epithelial, um, and its main function is going to be protection. So again, in areas that we have a lot of abrasion, we want those multiple layers of cell to protect the underlying tissues. Okay. So what we have, we have um, first stratified squamous. So again, we still have um, a lumen, right? And an apical surface close to the lumen. We also have a basal surface and the basement membrane with connective tissue below. Okay, but you can see all these nuclei lined up, stacked up. So this tells you there's multiple layers, or we have a stratified squamous, okay? Again, its function is going to be protection. 
You're going to find it in the esophagus, mouth, vagina, um, and places where you have more abrasion like the skin um, and epithelium. Oh, skin is a dry epithelium. Epithelium, epidermis of the skin. So all areas that there's going to be a lot of abrasion. Okay. There's two other types of stratified um, epithelial cells that we're not going to really talk about. I just included them here in case you were interested, <laughs> uh, but you're not really expected to know these types. So stratified cuboidal um, and an actual stratified columnar. So we talked about pseudostratified, which you're required to know, but stratified, um, not as important. So th these are both very rare. Stratified cuboidal can be found in sweat and mammary glands. Um, but it's typically only like two cell layers thick, so it's not super stratified. Your stratified columnar can be found, again, very rare, but in the pharynx, male urethra specifically, and lining some glandular ducts. Typically, it's at a transitional area between two other types of epithelial. Okay. So those are not, you're not expected to know. There are images of them in the atlas of your text if you want to see what they look like. And the last technically type of um, stratified epithelial tissue is transitional. Okay, and we don't consider it squamous, cuboidal, or columnar because the cell's shape um, actually changes quite drastically throughout the tissue. So you'll see you have columnar looking shapes, cuboidal looking shapes, kind of some squamous shapes. Um, but it's definitely stratified because you have, you know, these nuclei stacked on top of each other. So it's stratified. But the shapes, they don't really look like anything. Okay, and this again, structure tells you about the function. So the reason that they don't look like anything is because this tissue um, this function is to stretch. Okay, so it's going to be found in areas like your ureters, bladders, parts of the urethra that need to be able to stretch. So when your bladder fills up with urine, these cells are going to stretch out um, to provide room for that urine, right? Um, so transitional, technically a type of stratified, but it's a little bit different from the rest because the cells don't really look like um, the other shapes that we talked about. Okay, but again, you're always going to have a lumen, an apical surface on the top, and then the basal surface with the basement membrane and connective tissue below. Okay. All right, some other important epithelial structures. We have glands. Um, glands are made of epithelial tissue, um, and they are making fluid secretions. Okay. There's a bunch of different types. They're classified by the site of product release, and we'll talk about all this more in a few slides. But we have endocrine glands that in secrete substances internally, so think into your bloodstream. And we have exocrine glands that secrete substances externally, so think of like the surface of your body. So onto your skin, perhaps. So sweat, oils, those are all exocrine. So endocrine, they're inside your body. Exocrine, the substances think are exit, exiting your body. Okay. They're also classified by the number of cells that form the gland. Okay, so we have a uni unicellular or multicellular. Okay, so below um, we see that the glands are basically just made up of a sheet of epithelial cells that create this inward divot. It's called invaginated. Okay, exocrine glands are continuous with the cell surface and they release their substances again outside of the body. Exocrine, think exit. So if this is a sweat gland, sweat is going to be released onto the epithelial surface. Whereas endocrine glands, it's made the same way. So you have the invagination of the epithelial tissue, but eventually those connections are lost 
So instead of secreting s substances onto the surface of the skin, you're going to have vascularization or blood vessels going through that gland and hormones or whatnot being released directly into the blood supply to be distributed through the body. So that's an endocrine gland. It's just secreting substances inside the body. Okay. So again, this is just kind of what I just talked about, but endocrine gland are ductless, meaning they don't secrete to the surface. They're not released into a duct. Instead, they're released into the interstitial fluid. Remember, that's the fluid that the cells are bathed in, which is picked up by the circulatory system. They use exocytosis, right, which is using those vesicles to release things such as hormones, which are just chemicals that are going to travel through the lymph or blood, sp blood supply to their specific target organ. So they're just moving within the body. Okay? And once a hormone reaches its targeted organ, that organ's going to respond. So the endocrine glands release hormones really just to be a chemical messenger and get messages sent through the body to different areas. Okay, so they have specific hormones that are released, and they only um, interact with, you know, specific target um, muscles or other glands or whatnot. Exocrine glands, like I said, are releasing their secretions onto the body surface, such as the skin, or into the body cavities, too. So through your digestive system, you can have, you know, um, exocrine glands re releasing mucus, digestive enzymes, okay? Their products are secreted into ducts. And remember, those were the just like those invaginations that we have. So they're going to go through these ducts and then leave the ducts to go to the body surface. So things like mucus, sweat, oil, um, and our digestive enzymes are released this way. And they can be unicellular or multicellular glands, Okay? So I'll show you what that means. So a unicellular gland, the only one that we're really going to talk about are the mucus cells. Those are the goblet cells. They're found in the epithelial lining of intestinal and respiratory tract, and they're producing mucus um, to kind of help lubricate substances moving through. Um, so our respiratory tract is kind of keeping it moist. Our intestinal tract, we have food and stuff moving through. So this mucus that it's producing... Is just kind of like a lubricating, uh, uh, what's right here? It produces mucin, a sugar protein that dissolves in water to form mucus, which is a slimy protective lubricating coating. So as food stuff is passing through, that mucin and water mucus is going to protect those cells from um, too much abrasion, help pass food stuff through. Okay, and it's unicellular because it's just one big cell here. You can see there's a single nucleus, um, it's different secretory vesicles, um, but it's unicellular. We can also have multicellular glands. These are kind of more common and can do more different things. Um, they're composed of a duct and a secretory unit. Usually they're surrounded by connective tissue. All epithelial tissues are. Right, that support that supplies blood and nerve fibers to the gland. So the nerve fibers are going to innervate the gland and tell it to um, release things when it needs to. Right, the glands aren't just going to be always producing their substances. The nerve fibers are going to innervate it and tell it when it needs to release whatever it's releasing. And obviously, it needs blood supply to get the nutrients and whatnot that it needs. The multicellular glands can be classified in um, two ways by their structure and also the mode of secretion okay so again we're kind of breaking these down even further so we can have its structure so we have simple exocrine glands have whoops unbranched ducts compound glands have branched ducts we can have tubular glands where the secretory cells form a duct. Alveolar glands, the secretory cells form sacs. Okay, so here is what those look like. 
So we have the simple duct where the duct does not branch. And then the compound where each duct has a number of branches. And then the tubular, you can see the duct here um, is made up of those um, secretory epithelium. Whereas in the alveolar, you have these alveolar kind of like sacs that are made up of this secretory epithelium. Okay, so if it's alveolar, you have these kind of round balls on the end. Okay, and if it's compound, it's going to be way more branched. You have multiple branches. Okay, so that's the structure. And then the mode of secretion also is a way to classify. So three different types of um, these multicellular exocrine glands. Again, multicellular because you have multiple um, cells that are going to be producing the secretions. Okay, so back here too, I didn't really touch on that. But these cells are all going to be re are releasing the secretions, right? So unlike the goblet cell, you have a number of different cells making the secretions. So three different types. Marocrine glands produce or secrete products by exocytosis. So things like your sweat, pancreatic secretions are going to be marocrine. So this first one is an example of that. You see you have vesicles being created inside the cell with some sort of you know, substance to be released, and it's released through your duct. A holocrine gland, they accumulate products within the cell, and then the cells rupture to release. So instead of having vesicles being exocytosed, the cells themselves um, rupture, which is kind of cool. So things like your sebaceous oil glands are going to work this way. So you see in this, um, this one, you have the entire holocrine glands. You have the entire cell rupturing to release the products. Okay, and again, they're still releasing them out of the duct. It's just in a different way. And then the apocrine glands are the last type. Um, and they are going to, again, accumulate products within, but only the apex ruptures. Okay, um, and we're not really sure if this type of cell exists in humans. It's still kind of debated. Maybe in mammary cells producing breast milk. Um, but the main two types you're going to see, the marocrine and holocrine glands. Okay. All right, so that is the end of our epithelial tissue. Um, I'm going to stop here and then have a part two talking about the connective tissues in our body.